And when I was writing the book about loneliness, The Lonely City, I had such a strong sense that there was a narrative going on about people's bodies, about the pain people carried in their bodies, the sexual shame some people carried, the sense of illness and the shame of illness. And I could see that that was one of the causative factors of loneliness, but I also felt like I hadn't really got to the bottom of it. And at the same time, we were inside a political climate that was becoming increasingly violent and aggressive towards certain kinds of bodies. White supremacy was on the rise globally. In England, Brexit was happening. In America, there was the rise of the far right and Trump. And it was just, it was the refugee crisis. It was just this sense that the language around bodies had suddenly become much more extreme, much more violent. And I really wanted to know why. I really wanted to understand what the deeper roots of that was. And to look back into the 20th century and to try and understand some of those things about why certain kinds of bodies are regarded as such a threat, but also, and really crucially, what we can do about it and what people have done about it, what those freedom movements have looked like. Mm, mm. And you talk about this idea very beautifully in the book about uh, the body as a site of attack. Can you help us understand precisely what you meant by that? In some ways, I mean that very literally, that the body is a body that can be queer bashed, that the body can be subject to racial attacks, that the body can be put in a refugee camp, depending on the kind of body you live in, you're going to have certain different kinds of experience. But it's also much subtler than that. I think it doesn't have to be an act of physical violence. It's a sense that we exist within a hierarchy of bodies that we didn't consent to, that it, it already exists before we're born. So we exist into it, we arrive into it and discover that certain kinds of bodies are regarded very differently to other kinds. And I think my sense of politicization around that happened very young because I grew up in a gay family in a very homophobic, state-sponsored homophobia in Britain in the 1980s because of Section 28, which was a law that said schools couldn't teach about gay families. It's a pretended family and local councils couldn't give information about homosexuality. So already as a small child, I had this sense that some bodies are valued more than others. Some people's ways of loving are regarded as allowed and some aren't. And I think mm. that sort of politicization took, took me outwards into feminism into thinking about race, all of these different arenas. Mm. Um, I guess since a lot of things uh, in the last two years, the, a lot of things thing has, have been happening, the pandemic, the horrifying um, rolling back of women's rights and reproductive rights in the US. Have you thought differently about the definition of bodily autonomy since writing this book? That is such a good question. I think the thing that has happened particularly with America and rolling back of Roe versus Wade is just, to, you know, I've sort of argued these things, but to see it happen that viscerally, to see that a state really can control what we regard as our private freedoms, our private experience of our own bodies, that that can be absolutely changed, literally overnight by a government. I think that should make all of us <laughs> desire to put our bodies on the streets, desire to try and change those rulings that, that affect us so utterly to the, to the core of our being. 